Aruba Jamal is a Pakistani Muslim immigrant to the gorgeous, unceded Coast Salish lands known as Vancouver. In the past year, she has ran for political office as the youngest candidate in Vancouver's municipal elections, given a TED Talk on student activism, and helped co-found a leftist alternative student press, The Talent, at UBC. As a recent graduate, she is currently interning at Left Word Books, a Marxist publishing press in India, and will soon be moving to Ecuador to be a writer for Telesur English, a leftist pan-Latin American news press. She tweets a lot at Aruba Jamal and blogs a little under Aruba's umbrella.tumblr.com. Please help me in welcoming Aruba. Thanks, Saisha. Um, before I begin, I too would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional, unceded, ancestral, and occupied Coast Salish territories. Um, today we'll be talking about how Islamophobia and the media in particular has demonized and dehumanized Muslims, but I think it's also important for those of us that are settlers in the room to think about the colonial violence and dispossession that has happened on these lands and how indigenous people have been dehumanized and how the media has been a part of that process and continues to be a part of that process. Um, so we should be mindful of that. Um, so I'm going to start off things a little bit differently with a spoken word piece that I wrote last summer. It's got some references uh, that are a little outdated because we do have a new leader of our colonial electoral system. But um, they're, I think they're still relevant. So yeah, I'll begin without further ado. It's called Headscars and Hymens. Headscars and Hymens is a groundbreaking title of Egyptian feminist Mona al tahawis new book. I mean, I got rid of the gender roles, but I got enough eye rolls for this one. You see, there is an entire industry for Muslim women who want to save Muslim women. But I get it. It's a lucrative career option. Heck, I could see myself doing it. My first book would be called, let's see, uh, Muslim Girls, Modesty, and Masturbation. Or, mm, for short. And then I'd write a sequel and call it Behind the Veil, A Muslim Woman's Perspective, or Behind the Veil, Inside Iran, or Behind the Veil, An Intimate Journey into the Love Lives of Muslim Women. Wait, hold up. I'm getting a call here from my advisor, feminist Hillary Clinton. Can I borrow your phone? <laughs> <laughs> and she says, um, all these books have already been written, and that she counts them as among one of her favorites. <laughs> I guess I'll stick with my original title then. The Veil Unveiled. Unveiling the Veil Unveiling. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> because you know what? Despite what Palestinian poet Suhair Hamad says, I will be your exotic. I will be your erotic. Because there's money to be made in this. There are bills to be paid. There's Bill Clinton, Bill Gates, Bill O'Reilly. How else will they profit off of Western imperialism and capitalism? See, I learned all this in the Ivory Tower, an empire disguised as an education. I now hold a degree. What it taught me was that they don't call it the Black Tower, the Brown Tower, for a reason. So that's why you find yourself surrounded in a class full of white women who think the Girl Guides are a social justice organization, or that all the world's problems will be solved through the United Nations, or that bindis, dreadlocks, and headdresses are me appreciating your culture and not cultural appropriation. So I'm prompted to make my next capitalist venture, a rom-com about a heroic American soldier who falls in love with a hijabi woman and they get married and produce war and assimilation. But before I go any further, oh, another call here from my advisor, feminist Hillary Clinton. <laughs> For real. <laughs> um, and she says this movie's already been made and it's called Amira and Sam and she counts it as among her favorites. Now this is why they call me a grown woman. I can't help but groan at shit like this. <laughs> and maybe when I've succeeded in trading in the revolution for my resume, I'll be invited for a star at Parliament Hill to break my fast with Harper, build out my occupation while I'm on occupied territory. My mind will think of the indigenous woman he doesn't care about, the migrant woman he doesn't care about, the woman in the gab he doesn't care about. But I'll know neoliberals game real good by then. So I'll smile and say, thank you. Can you pass me the fruit salad? I think I just ate something bitter.
Thanks. So that's kind of my extended monologue on my frustrations with uh, media and the portrayal of Muslim women especially. But also that piece does explore how sometimes Muslims can take on those dominant narratives. Um, and I guess the reason why I became interested in media was because media was interested in me. We talk about this term, this post 9-11 era, and I think that means something pretty specific for a lot of us. Um, and I think it's because it's, a, it's characterized by a media landscape that has and continues to demonize Muslims. Um, I remember that it was in my last couple of years of high school that I began to think about media critically. And again, not because I wanted to, but because I was forced to become invested in this. So I'd be on the computer late at night, um, you know, reading articles. Um, and because I'm a masochist, I'd also be reading the comments at the bottom of the articles. Um, and a lot of these things that I read, you know, I hope for most of us, there are stereotypes and tropes that are pretty cliche now. But back then, as this young 16, 17-year-old, to hear them for the first time was pretty jarring. Like, Muslim women are oppressed. Um, Islam is barbaric. Muslims are inherently misogynist. Um, and I think this is the case for many of us. We're kind of anxious about a lot of mainstream media coverage for a lot of us that are at the margins, not just Muslims, but indigenous people, black people, other people of color, women, queer and trans folk. Because essentially, if you're not a straight, cis, middle class, white dude, you're probably going to have some issues with the media and representation. Um, so not to minimize my own experiences with bigot bigotry that I've had, I've had a lot of uncomfortable moments in the classroom. I used to be, I used to wear the hijab, so I was a very visible Muslim woman, often made to be like the spokesperson when we are talking about Muslims and terrorists, and I'm like, what the fuck, I don't need to talk, about, I don't have anything to say. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, uh, the climate of an Islamophobic media has also what's justified U.S. invasions in the Middle East. It's justified drone attacks, it's justified um, it's why Guantanamo Bay is still open, why there's police surveillance in Muslim communities, why we see arson attacks on mosques and temples even, and why we see hate crimes against those that are perceived to be Muslim, including many Sikhs. And unfortunately, I don't see this as something that's plateauing or declining anytime soon, especially as we see a lot of the coverage um, of elections on both sides of the colonial border, um, as we saw in October and as we're continuing to see with you know who and a lot of the others <laughs> um and I, so i guess that's why in the last couple of years i've been really passionate about alternative media i don't think that it's only I, I think it's integral to not only combating islamophobia but also i think it's integral to any social movement organizing having um a media that speaks truth to power Having a media that is diverse, I think, is extremely important if we're to combat all these isms. Um, and my experience with alternative media has been through the Talon, which is an alternative student press that a few of us, um, including some folks in the audience, started a couple of years ago at the University of British Columbia. So there were about 16 of us activists that came together. We were extremely frustrated with the coverage of um, our main campus paper and some of the stories they were covering, and so we wanted to bring critical campus media, or bring a critical lens to media on campus. And so um, there are basically two broad principles at the Talon that we wanted to have um, govern our publication and kind of guide us forward. And I think that, personally, I think that these are two uh, principles that a lot of other media can adopt. So the first thing was that we wanted to amplify the voices of those that are the most marginalized. And we wanted to center the most marginalized voices. That was our essential main purpose. And so, for example, if we were writing an article on decolonization, it was important for us to have an indigenous student um, be a part of that process and be a part of uh, helping us publish that piece. It was also reflected in the makeup of our group. Um, we had. Uh, groups from all different backgrounds um, as a part of our collective. And I think this is a part where we can really um, look at a lot of our media um, outlets and where a lot of improvements can be made. I think one of the biggest reasons why a lot of media coverage is problematic and reinforces a lot of dominant narratives is because our newsrooms are not diverse. 
they're not representative of the population. They're not representative of the issues that are we that we're that they're covering. Um, so, in that regard, I think that there's improvements could be made, uh, not just for like corporate mainstream media, but even like alternative media itself as well. Um, and the second kind of broad principle that was governing our publication was um, we wanted to start a conversation and a dialogue with those that don't necessarily see the world through an anti-oppressive lens. So we wanted to play that kind of knowledge building role. And I think a lot of alternative media does a really good job of that. Um, and I think continuing in that regard is really important to speaking to a broader audience. And so, for example, when there was a lot of Palestinian solidarity work that was happening on campus, um, we published like a one-on-one article on BDS, the Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions Movement. We also had a recurring um, column called the Social Justice Synonyms, where we looked at kind of oppressive language and that's embedded in our everyday discourses and it like, provided alternatives for people to use. Um, and so I'm taking all of this knowledge and all these experiences that I've gained from other people, mentors, um, through experience, my own uh, tangible experience, and I'll hopefully be taken in, into my new role as a writer for Telesur, which is, um, as Aisha mentioned, a pan-American leftist news press, and I think they're a really good example of reaching out to a broad audience that... Uh, and, and they're able to cover international politics from a critical alternative perspective. And they're unapologetic about centering the perspectives of those that are actually affected by the issues. And they're also unapologetic about speaking truth to power. So I hope that um, we, can con we continue to see this happen um, and continue to have media outlets that are not afraid to take that stance. And hopefully we'll see the demise of corporate mainstream media soon. Thank you. <laughs> and South Asian communities in